Okay, so I think uh, I will start. Uh, so the topic of uh, my lectures is the title is geometric unification. And um, my methods will be, oh, there are some. Okay. Just. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, so title is geometric unification, and uh, I will be using non commutative geometry as my tool to achieve this unification. Uh, to start with, essentially, for uh, at least physicists uh, who are familiar with general relativity, it's known that uh, general relativity is the example of a geometric unification, a geometric um, theory where the gravity is described through the geometry. In other words, as is now known, matter will tell space how to curve and uh, you know then uh, uh, the curvature would, would dictate the motion of particles and things like that so uh, I would be seeking in a way a geometric setting to unify all fundamental interactions and the quest for unification really started a long time ago and it, does, it did indeed started with Einstein uh, in his work with uh, Kaluza, where he tried to unify the only two known forces at the time, electromagnetism and gravity, within a theory which is geometrical, which is five-dimensional theory. One of the dimensions was thought to be small, and it was compactified. However, it turned out actually that the, that the electromagnetism that uh, Einstein uh, uh, or the five-dimensional theory had is not really electromagnetism, but uh, it's a different, uh, what we now call a gravity photon. It doesn't have the correct electric charge. Anyway, anyway, the time was wrong because not all forces were known at the time. So now actually we know more or less the full set of forces. So at least we are in better shape to, uh, to find or to, to, uh, to uh, achieve this goal. Um, Okay, so the main, the, the, of course, many attempts, you know, uh, recent attempts for unification, and uh, uh, the most, uh, you know, visible one is uh, string theory, where, uh, you know, the, the idea there uh, is that, uh, you know, you replace the point structure of space time with, uh, you know, strings. And uh, so in, the, in that case, of course, it's, you can think of it as also geometric unification, but uh, not in the same spirit. You know, it's not really based on uh, on some rules of geometry and axioms and things like that. Uh, <coughs> all right. So, what is uh, the? Uh, you know, of course, actually, another problem we would like to uh, to uh, attempt to to, uh, to solve is also quantum gravity. So when I say all fundamental, you unify all fundamental interactions, of course, I really mean the electromagnetic force and the weak force the strong force and the gravitation. The first three of course, the general structure of unification is now known, the grand unified theories. And um, so this actually, in principle, one would, be, one would know how to do. Uh, geometrically, of course, is really based on uh, simple geometry, which is uh, you know, what's called vector bundles or fiber bundles. So one can do that. Uh, <coughs> 
but not really, it's not really complete geometric unification in that respect. But one can, you know, give it geometric clothing, as I would say. You know, we can write everything in, in, this, uh, in this language of vector bundles and connections and things like that. This one can do. Uh, this actually, the first actually three are well understood because um, uh, one really can develop forms of what's called quantum field theory. And the quantum field theory, they're all realizable theories, which means that you really can do perturbation and uh, is, you know, is uh, well behaved, I would say. Quantum gravity, of course, at the, at the quantum level, nothing, little, I would not say nothing, I would say little is known. But as a classical theory, is really very well established. It works extremely well. And uh, so the, the issue that how to unify these in one frame, within one framework, a natural framework, that they, they simply comes out. Yeah, well, actually, when I say this is a force, now, of course, you know, I always say forces now, of course, actually, the other, the other aim, of course, is to explain particle spectrum. So it's not only the Higgs, actually. And uh, the particle spectrum that we know now, of course, is that we have three families of quarks and leptons. And um, also, on in addition, we have the Higgs field. And the Higgs field is the field responsible to giving all the fermions and the bosons their mass. So one, of course, actually, uh, in this respect, actually, even there is no geometry here. Because here, at least, you can say vector bundles. But here, it's simply, there are simply a doublet of scalar fields. H is a doublet. Now. These forces, you know, for example, uh, these are really described in group theory in terms of Lie groups. And for mathematicians, it's a vector connection on the U1 cross S2 to cross S2 3, which for, you know, for this, this, and that. Uh, now, one has, when I say explain the particle spectrum, because, of course, first you have three families is a big question. Unfortunately, I will not be able to say much why it is three. You know, We know that it's more than two, but we don't know why it is three and not more than three. Uh, why you have quarks and leptons, you know, the way these particles have certain representations, which I'm really going to derive in a way, uh, why they, they sit in those representations, um, we'll be able to see. Uh, at present, everything was developed historically by, you know, every part, every particle, when it was discovered, it was placed in a certain multiplet. And with time, actually, the picture took shape. I think by 1974 or 75, you know, the picture was more or less complete, except, of course, the top quark was not discovered until, I don't know, much later. But people were convinced that the picture, uh, the, the three families of quarks and leptons should be there. So again, actually, one has to explain all this. If one simply writes it down, it looks like, you know, uh, there is no reason. It looks OK, but there is no geometrical reason why, the way, why, why things are the way they are, OK? And it's the purpose, actually, of my lectures is that to show you that we are almost led uniquely to predict, actually, the three forces with the gravity and the representations that they are exactly of this form, uh, we will not be able to predict the three. Now, we have still no way of knowing or uh, finding out why there are only three families in nature. We, we don't know, you know. And not only that we don't know, I think nobody knows. For some time, you know, in string theory, it was thought that they have an explanation. And the explanation was always, you know, in terms of uh, Calabiao spaces as uh, some topological number. However, actually, it was always, you know, the three came out as number of families and anti-families. And, it, you know, the three came as something like 101 minus 98 equal to three. So it, it was not really three. So essentially, 98 will, uh, of, uh, you know, families and anti-families will be supermassive. And the three, the three lightest one would, 
Anyway, so anyway, now actually, in reality, nobody accepts that this is an explanation, actually. For, you know. um, so this is actually one of the problems. That many problems I will not be able to solve, but actually many, many things I'm going to, would be able to answer. Why the Higgs field will be able to answer this question. Why it's a doublet. Uh, why do we have quarks? Why do we have leptons? You know, and all the charge representations, they will come out as I go along. So this actually. So for instance, uh, you claim to predict there is only one Higgs? Uh, one Higgs, yeah, OK. So if tomorrow, second Higgs is discovered at I will, I will say. I, I, no, 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 no. It's, uh, I, will, I will say something on that, actually. Uh, you know, there is, there is an axiom, actually, which will. <laughs> there is an axiom. And this one of the axioms is that uh, we have linear connections. The connection is linear. If the connection is linear, we get that. If the connection is not linear, then we have another prediction that it's not that. Actually, all of this will fit, but we'll have also on top of it, <coughs> this will be the low energy <coughs> representation of a higher theory, which is really the Pati Salam, which is SU2 left cross SU2 right cross SU4. And in this theory, of course, the leptons of the quarks are really unified. And the lepton really comes at the fourth color, because uh, you know quarks have three colors, you know, red, yellow, blue, or whatever. So the lepton thought that's the fourth color. But of course, actually, this is really at much higher energy. And then it's broken. And then you know, you are going to get more Higgs and things like that. So this is the alternative picture. And it's unique also. You know, yeah, it's either this or that. OK, but uh, so it's one of the axioms that for a long time, you know, uh, we question whether one should take the axiom or not. And uh, now, you know, of course, the way I see that uh, this is a very good approximation. And probably it's, it will be the way it is. You know, I think uh, uh, it's unlikely that another Higgs will be discovered soon or another, uh, you know, U1 uh, field. But of course, you cannot rule it out because this, this possibility is there. It's a very nice possibility, this Patti Salam unification. It's really very nice. And uh, it will enable people to go all the way up. OK, so actually, this is the uh, ground setting. Uh, now, OK, so suppose that you are a physicist and you, you know, would like to unify all these forces. And you say, I'm, I'm going to look for a geometric way of doing this unification. So you try, actually, for a long time. You say, OK, what are the symmetries? of all these forces that I talked about. We know, actually, that general relativity is really based on diffeomorphism invariance. Everything we do, invariance. Which, of course, is linked to the equivalence principle. And uh, <coughs> one way to achieve it, of course, is that you make everything uh, coordinate Invariant, invariant under coordinate transformation. So every action that you write must have this invariance. OK? Uh, which is pretty strong. But in a way, actually, this really, in a way, guarantees that the metric of space time will have its universal interaction. Because you know, without the metric, you would not be able to write any invariant expression, usually, except topological. Topological, you can write, but apart from topological interactions, the metric is everywhere. And in a way, that would, as a consequence of that, you see that the gravity would interact with everybody because uh, there is no way out when you write a, vo you know, a density that you start by writing root g, which guarantees gravity is everywhere, actually. So it's universal. One way to look at the universality of the gravitational interaction, that the action you really cannot write except by using the metric. OK. And then, and it's really a semi-direct product with, <coughs> with the symmetries which I have written, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. This is electromagnetism. This is the weak, and this is the color. <coughs> so this is the symmetry that we have. And uh, one would attempt, actually, to, to find a geometric theory based on this invariance. And of course, actually, the problem is that it doesn't exist, actually. You know. uh, 
in principle, you know, one can show that you really cannot do it this way. You cannot simply find a higher symmetry uh, without, of course, having extra modes. For example, um, Kaluza Klein is a way of doing it, but uh, the price you pay is that you are really going because what happened in uh, in higher dimensional theories, of course, you know, five. Suppose that I link myself to five dimension. In this case, you get d five x. Everything is five dimensional. And in this case, you have fields. You have extra fields. And these extra fields, uh, you'd like to think of it from the four-dimensional point of view. And then you, you would say, OK, what do I do with, um, with the dependence on the fifth coordinate? So what do you do in dependence of fifth coordinates? You start to expand. And you assume that the fifth coordinate is like a circle. And then you take all the Fourier modes. And then you have an infinite tower of states. So what people do is that they truncate or chop out all the states and you know you get uh, you are really throwing out all the Kaluza mo uh, Kaluza Klein modes in string theory you keep actually <laughs> the extra states and so it's not really the same as you know taking a geometry which includes only these things uh, so now my assumption is that I will use non-commutative geometry as my setting, as the setting for unification. And the first question that we ask is that, you know, why should one go non-commutative, you know? Why should one go non-commutative? So suppose, actually, you know, I. I call this n, which is the diffeomorphism across G. So n, let n be my symmetry, which is diffeomorphism times some internal group. And uh, what I would like, actually, is that the diffeomorphism of this my space n would be this, would include, sorry, would include this. Or at least would be that. Uh, G is local, yeah. G is local, yes. In other words, actually, I would like actually a space such that the diffeomorphism of this space will be what we know. And, uh, you know, I will not really go through, through the mathematics of, uh, of proving that you really cannot do it except by, by going through non-commutative process in which you really involve matrices, essentially. Um, in which you involve matrices. So and uh, OK, so anyway. Let me, you know, at least start with uh, discussing non-commutative geometry. So, you know, there are many, many ways of uh, trying to lay the groundwork that, okay, we have to take non-commutative, but in reality, uh, see, all arguments will be only suggestive, and uh, the question is that if I take non-commutative, does it work, actually, because this is, uh, you know, the pies and the pudding. So what do we do? Uh, how? OK, so let me start as follows, actually. Let's take, actually, the data that defines a non-commutative space. And this data, let me write it this way. This is a spectral triple. And this actually decorations, which I'll discuss in a minute. You know, 
the non-competitive geometry would, in the end, of course, one may ask the question, would you be able to recover what we know? For example, would you be able to recover Riemannian geometry? And the answer, of course, is yes. It already includes Riemannian geometry. So it's not that you don't, you get completely off and you have no way to really communicate with what you already know. So this is really, would, it's a big test, actually. And uh, it's on the reconstruction theorem in which you can show that you can obtain, actually, all what we know, or most of what we know about, because the project is not complete, most of what we know uh, about the remaining geometry from the formulation of non commutative geometry. So let me actually define. Do you have the, the triple A, H, D, N, what? Uh, well, actually, the gamma. Yeah, I'll I define each in a minute, you know. So, A. Can you specify J and gamma? I will, I will, I will yeah. No. Yeah, I will, you know. Well, J actually, for physicists, it will be charge conjugation. Gamma is chirality, you know, if you are a physicist. This is the analogy. One is, uh, but uh, it's an antilinear operator, if you'd like to. Okay, what's it? An associative algebra. With unit one. and involution star. H is a complex Hilbert space carrying a faithful representation. Maybe I should. Presentation by of the algebra. Uh, made a mistake. I should have started here, actually. Anyway, D is a self adjoint there self adjoint operator on H with the resolvent D minus lambda inverse where lambda not the amount of R and D is compact. Is compact. D is, for first it will be the Dirac operator. This is generalized Dirac operator. In other words, actually, for people who are familiar with Dirac operators, you know that on curved spaces, you know, for, for mathematicians, uh, you know, all the Atiyya, Singer indices, and uh, so the Dirac operator carries a lot of uh, information about the topology of the space. And um, in other words, you know, with the Dirac operator, it's really equivalent to knowing the metric. You know, what happens that in the construction of Dirac operator, you always take the square root of the metric with the Firbein, and it enters there. So, uh, and the spin connection there, the geometry the spectrum of the Dirac operator actually really has it carries inside most of the geometric information about the space. Uh, what is compact with D minus one? D minus Of D is compact. Yeah, of D. Of you know, I forgot to <laughs> off. <laughs> forgot to write the off. I I changed the line. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, still, uh, let me, should I erase or should I, uh, maybe, just a second, let me push it up. Okay, now actually the J is an antilinear operator. Anti, sorry, unitary. Not 
It's anti-unitary. It has it involves complex conjugation because on H. It's a real structure. In other words, the reality of the, in other words, it really takes us from complex geometry to real geometry. The, the, the role of the J to take us to real geometry, essentially. So for physicists, it's charge conjugation. Gamma is a unitary operator on H. And it is the chirality. OK? Now, properties. I have only simply defined things. Now, of course, we have to know how these objects talk to each other. But the involution yes. of the algebra star is yeah. star well, for, example. for an algebra of function, what is the involution you talk about? Well, for example, you know, something like this, right? And also square the involution is the identity? No, no, there, the existence, there's an identity element, you know. You need the I existence. Think about involution, the involution. By, uh, by default. If you apply it twice to an element to get the element itself. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. This is who could get to our diagram, but otherwise it's the same. Okay, properties. First, J squared is epsilon, where epsilon, epsilon prime, epsilon dot prime, elements of minus or plus one. For example, uh, epsilon is zero, sorry, one in zero dimension and minus one in four. C squared is minus one in that case. Okay. Then we define, so let A be an element of the algebra A and B actually. Then we define the opposite element B as J B star J inverse. And this is called the opposite algebra. In this case, we say B opposite is an element of A opposite, the opposite algebra. And is defined element. Now let psi be an element of the an element of the Hilbert space, you can think of it say as a spinner. Yeah. Then you know you can act on element of the Hilbert space like this. You can act from the left. Action from the left. Then A opposite would act from the right. So in this case, we write it like this. Uh, okay, uh, no, it's if, okay. If you act from the uh, equivalent, actually, so an action from the right. Okay, so if you have something B A, it's the same as B opposite you. Uh, now, action from the right is equivalent to action of the opposite algebra. So here, yeah, this is right action. Now, this is actually first action, action. The right action, the right action, and the left action commute with each other. J squared equals epsilon, that was an axiom, if you will? Yes. These are the properties, actually. But in zero dimension, in dimension. Yeah, well, you know, we'll, I will talk about it, actually. It so, it so happened, actually, this is, you know, uh, if, think of it this way. If you want to do, do uh, charge properties of charge conjugation operator, the properties of charge conjugation operator really in Euclidean space, say, they depend on dimension. And 
their properties were their square is one and it's not one and you know you can take their action on the Clifford algebra and you discover actually that they satisfy all these properties and this actually in the usual metric dimension however these operators would work on something called the KO dimension uh, which is the cohomology orthogonal uh, cohomology orthogonal and uh, they have uh, the same properties so usually we define the dimensions not in the metric sense but in this abstract sense and these dimensions do coincide actually with the properties of say charge conjugation, conjugation operator uh, of spinners of the orthogonal groups in this way uh, in the corresponding dimension they have exactly the same properties yeah no, this actually is, yeah, proper. This is the proper. G square is absolute. Yeah. Okay. And the two actions, they do agree, the left and the right. Well, they commute. They commute. Ah, commute. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't see it. Action one, left and right action commute. Now, second, this actually, let me say, called property one, property two, is that DJ co you know, is JD up to a sign. That's, that's what it means, actually. G this means J squared is plus or minus one. DJ commutes are anti commutes with JD. As I said, all these are elements of minus one and plus one. And, um, And then third, D gamma always anti commutes with the D. But J gamma is absolutely wrong gamma J. Now, notes actually that now I have introduced three signs. And depending on the signs, uh, it means you can classify depending on the signs of epsilon, epsilon prime, epsilon double prime. You can classify them on, in a table, OK? And for we, each, you can you know, label, give a label. Now, the label actually is really done in such a way that it really coincides with those. Because in principle, you can call it any, anything you like. It's taken to coincide with the classification of what we call Majorana and Weil spinners. <laughs> Majorana and Weil spinners uh, in um, when we are talking about you know, Clifford algebras and charge conjugation matrices. It's exactly the same classification. So the, when I say dimension now, it doesn't mean metric dimension. It means dimension that, so usually you are going to get, because it's, you know, you have three signs, it means you have only eight possibilities, right? Because it's mod eight, it's minus, it's two cubed. So you are going to get eight possibilities depending on the signs of epsilon, epsilon prime, epsilon double prime. So actually this you can do, epsilon. And then you can start making a table and you know, you can stay one, 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 you call it zero. Yeah. And then you have one, one minus one. This actually you don't define except for even spaces for, you know, uh, minus one. Plus one, minus one, and so on. So you really can make a table, and uh, these are called the KO, KO dimension. You know, I can uh, write it down minus one. How many one? Yeah, four minus ones, so then I have one, one, two minus one, one. Okay. And then it skips, then you have one, and then you have minus one. Anyway, so this is actually called this end. K 
Okay, elbow measure. And the way it is chosen, as I tell you, you know, it's really chosen to agree with the, with the existence of what we call uh, Majorana and vile spinners. For example, people in string theory would recognize usually uh, uh, the 10 dimension, actually. 10, actually, 10 dimension is really, you have to look at 8, which is the 0, which is 1, this one. You know why? Because in 10, in 10 space type, dimensions you are going to say to get uh, minus plus plus nine times right and the two would essentially cancel each other so you are really talking about eight essentially and if you make the classification you discover that everything repeats itself mod eight that's the reason actually why Majorana vile spinner would exist in two dimensions and then ten dimensions okay and the two you know because the plus minus cancel each other is really equivalent uh, you know, zero is equivalent to two, and you know, then the next one would be ten dimension. And uh, yeah, it's the chirality, gamma of chirality. Yeah, in four dimensions it's called gamma five, but of course in ten dimension it does exist. It's still <laughs> it's still called gamma eleven in that case. You know, so traditional. Yeah, gamma five. Okay. So, uh, where it happen here. OK, so what do I do with that now? Uh, should I keep using the center or? Now, axiom two, which actually in the last lecture I'm going to throw to see what happens if I don't assume <coughs> dA be opposite zero. What does it mean actually? I will show later. It's not really clear actually that, uh, okay, it's uh, not trivial to show that if you don't assume this, then the connection will not be linear. We'll have quadratic, only quadratic, not higher, actually, which is really a novel phenomena here, because we don't know it actually in any other uh, field that for all a, b, element of a. It's called first order condition. However, actually, there are no non-commutative geometries for which this condition is, does not, is not true, actually. And this is really a quantum sphere. It's not true. Uh, then actually, yeah, I forgot. Gamma squared is one. The gamma commutes with elements of the algebra for all A element of A. And therefore, Gamma is the chirality operator, which implies the Hilbert space would split into H plus and H minus, which would have actually you know implications for physics because it will ask that you are really going to get left-handed spinners and right-handed spinners. <coughs> Now, we do assume that H is endowed with an A bimodule structure such that this I did, Xib is A B opposite. This actually tells me exactly where to put the opposite element when I transpose it. Okay. A has a well defined 
unitary group where u is an element of a and u u star is equal to u star u is 1. Now, finally, coming to an end, it's not just definitions because it will finish at some time. The natural adjoint action of U on H is given by Xi go U Xi U opposite. Not actually the way it acts, the joint action. It acts on both sides from both the right and the left. It's very important because actually it would really tell me this is really for physics. You know, I didn't know, uh, recognize it. You know, it took me years to recognize this thing. It really has big implications on the structure of the representations of particles in physics. It's not obvious, but it will, become, it will come. And this um, U, J, U star, sorry, U, J, U, J star, Xi. Because remember, your opposite is that. So it takes this. Um, sorry, you star here. Yeah. You psi, you star. So it takes this form because remember, this comes as you star. When it comes here, it comes as you star opposite, right? Which means that it is J U star star J star, which is this guy. Okay. Yeah, j minus one. Okay, you know, j minus one is the j, j, j star in this case, right? Yeah, is one, which means essentially that j star is epsilon j, if you like. Yeah. It's, you can call it j inverse the same story. Yeah, because j squared is epsilon, you know, so it's. Um, yeah, because you can do by, you know, taking the complex conjugate of that relation. All right. Now, next. Now, we define... You see, I'm not, I will not go through all, you know, that you define in a, in a, product, uh, in a product in this space that the D acts on the Xi. This is natural, you know, and D would act, the Dirac operator would act on an element of the Hilbert space. Then you can take the inner product to form a scalar, and this scalar takes this form, okay? Now, what one would like, of course, is that this be invariant under the above transformation, the unitary transformation, about the transformation which is uh, here, we have written it, uh, this one, be invariant under the, under the given the mentioned transformation. Now, and however, it's not actually. If you do, then what happened, you know? This would really go into, you discover that this product, you are really going to get things like U, J, U, J star into D of U, J, U, J star, star. And then actually you discover that this is, there's not really invariant, and uh, it, it really moves along u d u star, 
plus epsilon prime j u d u star j. Of course, it's obvious why, because the d is going to act on all these guys, you know? It's a differential operator, it will act. And obviously, this is not invariant. So this, this is not really strange, because this is the way uh, that happens when you, uh, you know, in electrodynamics, it's known that you really have what we call phase invariant, right, psi. And if you let this be a function of x, you discover that this is not really invariant anymore. And the solution of that is very simple. What you do is that you introduce a connection to make this thing invariant. And then your set d mu would go into d mu plus i e mu, right? This is the usual way. This is, of course, no different than the other one. And so what happened is that this d has to replace with dA, which involve fluctuations. Where A is defined to be a one form. Summation of all possible lies. I will show later actually that this A really is a connection on this non commutative space. Once we define our proper non commutative space, would include all gauge connections as well as the Higgs field. So the Higgs field in that case, you know, would be another. Uh, one of the hex connections, one of the gauge connections. Uh, one thing actually I have not included, actually, is not really included here, which takes uh, this actually are called inner automorphisms. This type of transformation is here that psi goes this one, psi u. Okay? Now, the other thing which I didn't talk about is outer automorphism, which essentially uh, has to do with the fact that D, you know, and th that, uh, in a way, I will, I, will, I will try to explain later that this way, even if I start from really a trivial flat geometry, let me say, I will be able to discover all the, the most general geometry from fluctuating around the flat geometry. Okay, this is not strange because, after all, you know, in uh, for people who are aware in particle physics, they always always like to obtain general relativity as taking a flat space and then introducing some metric fluctuating around it. And of course, you'll be able to discover all the all the curved space, the curvature, and things like that by doing this um, this fluctuating. So here, actually, is no, no different. And in, in reality, actually, one really has to fluctuate the D with outer automorphisms to generate to generate actually the curved uh, the curved uh, metric out even of a flat metric. So in other words actually in principle even if one knows very little you only know some flat space you'll be able to generate the most general uh, curved space in the non commutative context. Okay. So what do I do? So essentially, now I, I claim that even with this little mathematics that I, I introduced, uh, I'm really somehow, uh, I have enough information to start and attack the physics problem. How should I do that? Now, you know, here, what the, the thing is that what I'm telling you that, look, no, instead of using you know, the matrix starting with ds squared, equal j mu nu dx mu dx mu, we are really replacing this with some spectral data. So we, I only replace you know, things with the metric and how to measure distances by saying, look, I'm not really going to study that. What I'm going to study is that I define my space through some data. And then I look at the spectrum of the Dirac operator. The spectrum of the Dirac operator in principle, has all the geometric information that I need. You know, this looks abstract, but we'll show that it, it's indeed the case. Uh, so the, the, this way, 
you know, of course, I can define distances in these spaces and things like that, but it's, uh, it's really more elaborate because you don't do it that way. Everything is done by making a cutoff on the, on the eigenvalues. So everything is done through eigenvalues of the Dirac operator, of the D operator in this case. Maybe we should not call it Dirac, because Dirac would you know, immediately think that it is simply four-dimensional or whatever. It's... You know, PSD has a discrete spectrum. It, it, it can have both. It, ha it, it can have, you know, it's like in quantum mechanics. An operator can have... No, but it, it, according to your assumption. No, it can have both still. Even according to my assumption, it can have both, okay? Uh, and, you know, the, my, okay, how, how do I proceed? I have to make an assumption, okay? How, the assumption I'm going to make, and this is really relaxed from our knowledge in a way, because if I really know some non commutative space in which I can give you the data. In principle, I can compute everything out of it, and I should be able to derive all the physics. But I don't know the space. I don't know what space should I take, which is really non commutative. So what we do, we make an approximation. What is this approximation? And anyway, this approximation, one expects to hold up to extremely small distance. This approximation is that the space that we live in or let me say space-time, is defined to be a non-commuted space, non-commuted geometric space, and is given by A, H, D, J, gamma, such that, that it is really the 10 step product of two spaces. One continuous, which is the four-dimensional we know, and the other discrete, which we have to find out. Okay? So in this case, I can say A equal A1 tensor A2, H is H1 tensor H2, J is J1 tensor J2, gamma is gamma 1 tensor gamma 2. However, the D is not trivial. It is D1 cross 1, say, plus gamma 5. Let me assume, you know, we call gamma 5, as Pierre has suggested, that cross D2, and where gamma 5 with D1 anticommutes. Now, it's true, actually, that this looks like a trivial product space. However, it's not trivial. And the reason is that we are going to discover that all the physics somehow is really dictated by the spectrum of d squared, essentially. <coughs> the d squared has the geometric invariant. If you compute d squared, you have a mixing. <coughs> you know, of course, d squared in this case is d1 squared plus d2 squared. But nonetheless, you know, the d squared knows about both in this case. So this is the. Okay, what's A1, let me say? Okay, say I, I'm going to be very conservative, and I'm really going to take A1 to be the usual, what equivalent to a Riem the data that corresponds to a Riemannian manifold. What's the data corresponding to a Riemannian manifold? The algebra, the algebra of functions, and, uh, you know, uh, differentiable functions in this case. And A2 is the Hilbert space of square integrable spinners. And uh, dm, actually, or d1 in this case, I'm going to call gamma mu d mu plus omega mu. Now, of course, actually, here you may start to object to tell me, look, how do you know that you are really going to get that? As I said, even if I don't know, I only know that I have flat space, that I have gamma mu d mu, OK? I would be able to generate this for you. How do I generate this for you? Well, you know, you apply a general constant. First of all, in this gamma mu, of course, this is not invariant on the general constant transformation. You have to make it invariant. And then you write it like this, yeah? And then, of course, actually, when you act on the spinners of psi, because the spinners, you know, they, um, they, they would, uh, they would uh, transform under the orthogonal group, you'll discover, actually, that you are really going to, to make it covariant. You have to put a connection, which is the spin connection. You put the spin connection, and then you can, you know, I can do the calculation 
if you are interested, in which I show you the real condition on the most general D that you can construct, which is really consistent with the, with the property of the hermeticity of the operator D. Then I can show you that you can allow spaces with special torsion, which would correspond you know, to what was known as the B field in string theory. It's still consistent. You can go, you can push it a little bit further, but not more. Anyway, there are certain conditions on the torsion that you can do. So th this calculation can be done. But the important thing that, you know, this is, in principle, is part of the remaining geometry or the continuous aspect of this non commutative space. So, uh, but now we are really faced with this question. I said that this space is a product of, you know, continuous times discrete. What is this A2, H2? Well, I'm going to call it, you know, uh, A finite, H finite, J finite, gamma finite. It's some finite space. You said A2 is the A2 spinners on the same manifold. A1, sorry, no, no, I said, sorry, H1. <laughs> so, I'm talking only about you know one now. Two is discrete. Now the question that we really now have to ask is what is this finite space? For a long time, historically, you know, so this work I have started to do with Alan, you know, in the long ago, 97 or something. And uh, for a long time, this was taken ad hoc, you know. The space was simply taken to be. Uh, two by two matrices and one by one matrices and things like that. And uh, in the end, we, yeah, co corresponding to, you know, knowing somehow it was constructed phenologically, looking at the answer and see what would fit geometrically. So <coughs> it's, uh, it's like, you know, you are given to solve a problem and you are given some data and you try to fit it and you find some answer, okay? And the answer was found and in the end, actually, the algebra was found, for example, to be this finite, was found to be like C plus H plus M3 of C. And this was done after, you know, some trial and error. And, you know, it was the answer. Oh, this, uh, uh, I think they put so much grease probably so that it can fly by itself. Okay. Or, so now actually, after many attempts, uh, we decided to do a classification of all possible finite spaces. You know, what are the possibilities to get a good answer? Because it's not really, um, it should not be God given, you know, that we take this because it works. That's not, and this was one of the criticisms actually against this program say, okay, you know the answer, you try to fit the answer, and so on. So what we try to do with that, we classify all finite spaces which are consistent with the axioms that I have written before. Okay? Now I'm going to show you that, you know, almost uniquely, because, you know, probably in mathematics, there's always some little cases which come out and will be difficult to exclude, but for, you know, most practical purposes, the analysis gives us, you know, almost unique answer. If By the way, usually the exceptions are the most interesting thing. Yeah, but we look we look at the you know, we look at the exceptions, we look at the exceptions. The problem is that the exceptions are not interesting, but the problem how to rule them out <laughs> from you know higher principles is very difficult, you know, because you know, I will show you that you know sometimes you have to impose some symmetry. If you don't impose, then you are really going to get some nonsense. But the question is that of course is not convincing that you say simply, I, I take it out. So it's, uh, there will always be something, definitely. OK, however, you know, before, before moving on, I will point to two things that we are considering. First of all, since we are using spectrum of Dirac operators, we are really forced to take Euclidean spaces. Now, the issue of how to go to Minkowski 
or in other words, how does time emerge is really a deep question. And it's really very similar to, it's exactly the same actually, uh, the question facing people who do path integrals in quantum gravity. Because there, or you do path integrals, you are forced to take you know, Euclidean spaces, otherwise things don't make sense. And the question how to go back and what's the criteria is really a thorny issue. And you know, it's uh, still. But that's why, because D is the emission in the real spectrum. Yeah, but you know, yeah, but if you consider, suppose you have any. It could have a continuous spectrum, so let's have a continuous spectrum. Um, the is a continuous spectrum. You want it's the unboundedness, actually. It's the unboundedness, not the continuous. Continuous is okay, but unboundedness is the problem because with plus minus signatures, you can go to the negative. And you would like things, as you see, with, is exactly when you do path integrals in, uh, for gravity or even for gauge theories, you know, you would like things to be positive. And um, this you can only achieve in Euclidean space. So but D has both plus and minus eigenvalues. Yeah, yeah. D, D, D is not the problem, actually. You know, the problem is that D squared, since usually you are going to discover that the spectrum is really D, D, D squared is the deciding spectrum. And uh, then things will become unbounded if you take negative. Yeah? So the action, in other words, the action, you, need, you need the action, yeah. You need compact. Yeah. Compact, not only Euclidean. Euclidean and compact. Uh, well, it's called, you, you, what do you mean, Euclidean, yeah, it's... Uh, Euclidean is Euclidean signature. You agree, yeah, I think you, in Euclidean, Euclidean signature is enough, I think, in our cases. Yeah, is enough. Uh, okay, so this actually is one of the problems. The other problem we will face is that, okay, in Euclidean, as a consequence of that, of course, then the question of fermions, which we are really going to get, would become problematic because it's known actually that, uh, especially this problem faced uh, lattice gauge theorists, is that then immediately you get what we call doubling of Fermi's. And the reason of the following, you know, I can tell you. Suppose that, you know, you have this psi element of H, then you can take G psi, and then the problem is G psi is an independent spinner or not, you know. If you have no relation, then it's not related to psi. Uh, then it will be a new spinner, and then you, you know, <laughs> physics-wise, you are going to find that every particle has a mirror, and this, of course, is unacceptable. Anyway, so essentially, we really have to require that we have to solve the Fermi doubling problem. Now, to solve the Fermi doubling problem, it would mean the following: that this product space that I talked about must ha must have something like k all dimension zero. Why? Because then, it, and only then, I can impose, for example, both what we call the chiral condition and the Majorana condition simultaneously. If you don't do that, then you're going to double your fermions, which is a catastrophe physics-wise. Now, however, we know actually that at least the four-dimensional part, the four-dimensional part, you know, as already mentioned, you know, let's think now in Minkowski for a moment. The four-dimensional part is really equivalent to two as we know now. You know? Why it's two? Because the plus minus of the signature. Remember, I told you that um, if you have signature, say plus, minus, minus, or minus, plus, plus, plus. Two minuses, minus plus essentially recancel each other, and then you are talking about effectively two. And uh, so obviously, if you only take space-time by itself, you can never put both conditions simultaneously. You are really forced to tensor it with another space whose KO dimension should be 6, because 2 plus 6 is 8. 8 is, modulo, is 0 mod 8, right? So this really forces, so to start with, actually, to solve the firm double problem, we are really forced to take finite space to be of k, sorry, k o dimension 6. In other words, actually, the total space should really have dimension 10, like 6 plus 4 is 10. Now, this should not come as any surprise for people who are familiar with supersymmetry, because supersymmetry 
you know, up for the first dimension where you can employ both conditions simultaneously is two. And this is where you have this nonlinear sigma model in two dimension. And the next one is 10, and that's where the heterotic string would exist. And, you know, so this is, is known for a long time. That, and, you know, it's, it's, it looks different, but the same. You know, mathematics is exactly the same. You know, the wording is different. So now actually it's... How did you jump from 0 to 6, not 0 a? Yeah. I'm confused, yeah. Exactly. No, that's not. So again? 4. 4 we know, okay. In uh, 4 is the continuous. 4 continuous, no, but I want the product to be 10. I want the product to be 0. The, four, the product should be 0. Of the product, this should be 0, yes? Of the product. Yeah, exactly, of the full space. Because then I can impose this condition. Of course, I know I cannot impose it on part on the, not the other. That makes sense. I have to impose it on the full space. If I want to impose on the full space, then I know that the KO dimension of the full space should be eight. Because then, in this case, according to my table, still up, you know, one, one, one is really dimension zero or eight, whatever. Okay. Now we know that dimension four. Now, of course, now actually you tell me you are cheating because you are saying you are talking about Euclidean and suddenly you jump to Minkowski. It looks different, actually, in Euclidean, and I will talk about it later, actually, what happens in that. It's more very interesting, actually, the, the way it solves itself in uh, Euclidean signature uh, is different than the way it solves itself in uh, Minkowski signature. Uh, there, actually, determinants, you don't get determinants, you get the Pfaffian instead, and, you know, so it's a uh, it's, uh, it's different, it's diff different mechanism, I would say, to solve the same problem. I will come to. So now you have four Euclidean dimensions. You want to add. Yeah, four, four, four Euclidean, yes. Zero modulo eight. Yes. So you don't get six because you need the signature. It's not two first. Yeah, exactly. So I, no, now actually, yeah. yeah. Uh, the way it solves itself is different, as I said, you know, because the way it solves itself is that you take actually this six and this is four because we know that, you know, when we continue analytically, this would be the answer. Now, how does it solve itself? I will talk about it later that uh, when you do path integrals, you don't really get determinant of the D. You are going to get the Pfaffian of the D. And the Pfaffian of the D, it means you don't integrate over the fermions and the uh, conjugate. You, only intern you can only integrate on the fermions, you know. So you, you cut, you cut the, the degrees by half. And it solves the problem in this very nice way. Anyway, but uh, think of it actually just uh, uh, this way that we really need a KO dimension six for the finite dimensional space. So no, this is the now this is the problem is how to. By the way, there is something very strange in the discrete space. This is a one particle. I mean, you presented it. I mean, for the continuous space, this is a one particle in the space. Yeah. Why don't we want a continuous geometry based on many particles? The, the fact to say, oh, there are spin offs and things like that, you say innocently because Alan has been saying that for yeah, years. Yeah. <laughs> but this is, this is not convincing at all. I mean, yeah. We are talking about physics. So what okay. what the book is based. Yes. What to say. Yeah, but, the yeah, but it's like suddenly to say fermions, spin offs, and it's not, it's not natural. I mean, it's, it's a big action. Uh, you mean to take take spinners as your basis? That's what you are objecting. That to take spin half as your uh, as your. Because one particle state coming in. Uh, well, physics is not one particle state. Okay. Yeah, well, actually, okay. See, the question that you see, I I know exactly what you what you intend, but uh, the question how to formulate geometry in terms of other particles will become more and more complicated. You know, the issue is whether is spin half is a building block or not. Actually, this is this you can think of it as uh, as uh, an answer. The question, you know, if you look at Wheeler book, you always thought that the spin half is the building block. OK, uh, and indeed, actually, for example, out of spin half, you can build uh, spin zero, spin one, spin two. You can build, you know, out of uh, so in principle, you can think of the spinner as the building block. But of course, you know, you may argue that why should I take this as, as a basis of geometry? You know, this is uh, is well taken. But I think uh, if you take the other point, it becomes too complicated. I, I would say this is a, it becomes too complicated to handle. So my answer is that you will have to perform a second quantization after that. 
this is the first step. Yeah, then actually the problem is that, okay, the, 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 the proper way of doing it then actually, then you have actually to consider enlarging your geometric space to consider operators that act on, you know, higher, higher representations. Yeah, and then, of course, then it becomes m much more complicated, but of course it doesn't rule it out, you know, I cannot say it. Uh, complication is not an argument that it's not there. All right, so now actually we are at this uh, juncture, and at this juncture we have to now say what are the possible spaces that would agree with all the axioms. So what do we do? Now, Okay, classification of finite non commutative spaces of K. Well, actually, in, okay, K all dimension six, if you want. Dimension six. Yeah, well, actually, probably the part of that classification will go without this dimension six, but to dimension six, I mean, you know, immediately will cut, will, will, will cut things out. Uh, but before we say, I will there are really only two possibilities. Interestingly, there are only two, two sets, two, two kind of spaces that you can have, regardless of the six, okay? Interesting, but so finite dimensions. So here it means finite algebra. Uh, finite algebras. You know, what are they? Are, are they algebra of matrices? Are they quaternions or what? You know, what are they? Are they uh, octonions? You see, this is the question. Finite dimensional algebra. And the Dirac operator on the finite dimension. It's a ma set of matrices. They are the okay. Physics-wise, I well, want Dirac operator. Yeah. It's a family of Dirac operators. You know, it's, you you can get okay. The question is that what is the set of all possibilities? And we discover actually that this matrix will be nothing but the Yukawa coupling of a quark and the leptons. Okay. So the Dirac operator is one matrix finally. Yes. There is, yeah, okay, it will turn out to be, but, but before I don't know. On the emission metric. Yes, yeah. But, you know, this is the answer. But so you know, all these rules. Yeah. 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 yeah, but uh, of course, in this case, of course, you tell me what's the algebra in this case, okay? And, you know, okay, I can tell you the result and then you go on. Maybe some people will not be here next week and they say, okay, we missed that. Anyway, there are really, okay, yeah, only two possibilities. Because if I take a trifold algebra, it can be a very large dimension. Yeah, yeah, but uh, this is not allowed, actually. It's not allowed. The only two possible algebras will turn out to be M, N of C, where N is K squared, actually, or, or A, M, N of C. Well, I should say the complexified algebra. The complexified algebra can only be this of this one. Only two cases. So in this case, the center of the algebra is Z, while here is Z plus Z. Okay? Uh, and for this, actually, I only use, only use. The same n for both factors? No, no, different. You know, this is for so arbitrary. Arbitrary. Ah, here, here they are the same, yeah. Here are the same. But up and down, you know. So, uh, We only use a zero order condition. That A, we didn't use the first order condition. Only this, that left and right commute. Left action, right action commute is all what you need to show that these are the only two possible, two possible uh, algebras that are there. And you don't use the existence of a gamma and a J? Sorry? You, the existence of a gamma and a J are not used here. The, 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 the tensor J, yeah, of course, used. The J is used. Yeah. Ah, oh, look, ah, but this is an axiom. Look, the rest are properties. Let me say. The rest are properties, which, you know, but this is an, that actually we assume that the uh, x uh, that uh, now of course actually you may tell me look uh, maybe everything is an axiom <laughs> the j squared is an, everything is an axiom but at least okay 
The only thing which is not used in, in is this condition. The dA B opposite is 0. Uh, is not used. For t in this classification. But later, actually, I'm going to use it to cut it down into, into that answer which I told you about. It comes in, and you know it really has physical implication on the neutrino masses, <laughs> which, of course, is immense interest for physics. Now, how is the proof done, actually? You know, the proof is really involved. You know, it took all the expertise of Alain to improving theorems to, uh, to crack it down, because uh, and it was really very surprising that you, you know, because a priori we don't know. You know, we could have obtained millions of possibilities. And uh, however, we only obtain these. The proof is based on the following, actually. And I cannot, because that would take me one hour simply to, to go through the proof. But I don't know, maybe I will do it next time, in which I, um, I, I will give the steps of the proof. And I will give you know some uh, tensorial notation for everything I said today. I write it in terms of matrices, so it will become more down to earth. Because up to now, I have been you know, simply using things abstractly. Uh, the only thing, actually, which is used is that the existence of an idempotent element, e squared equal to e, e equal to ae. So you assume that this element, this projection operator, does exist. <coughs> and uh, once you do that, then you can show that you can have, at most, either only one, only e, or E1 and E2. <coughs> such that, you know, uh, so in this case, E1, E2 will be 0. And E1 squared is E1, E2 squared is E2. And this will be E squared equal to E. So I, you know, th it means that one can show that <coughs> Uh, you can have. So the way it's done that you assume you have many, and then using all the properties of the J, and how you cut all the projection operators, how they act on each other, how they, they would, uh, they would uh, talk to the J. And you'll discover that you know, this is the only the pr proof is not that complicated, actually, part of it. Part of it is really, is really difficult. But part of it, which is this part that you can have only E1 and E2, is um, it's not difficult, you know. I, I, maybe next time I will go through it. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but let me, let me. Uh, so in this case, actually, in this case, the J it acts on the x like x star, while in the other actually this case, if you have J of x y, it would be y star x star. So here, because you have two algebras, so the way it's, uh, it acts on it that takes complex conjugation or Hermitian. Conjugate and now. Uh, yeah, dagger for physicists. Yeah. So. Now. Okay. Now, what do we do after? Then essentially here, uh, here actually here, the first case is inconsistent with k o dimension 6. And this is how you rule out this thing. It's inconsistent with the k o dimension 6. You can take it. It would give you, you know, mirror fermions and things like that. So this is really thrown out. And you are left with this guy. Now, now at this point, actually, at this point, so this is actually the complexified algebra is, uh, let me see. OK. So anyway, in this case, actually, the algebra is the same as the complexified algebra. So the question, what do we do with this case? And um, uh, here, we were forced to make an assumption. that. One of the algebras, one of the algebras, of 
on, on, one, on one of the algebras, there exists an isometry I such that I squared is minus 1. And it acts on the first one. And it really limits or restricts. Well, actually, here, no, it's, uh, it's like, um, think of it like I, suppose that x, an operator I acts on elements, say, of M and C like this. Let me call it uh, alpha I, I think, uh, let me see, um, is uh, like alpha transpose or something like that. Uh, maybe alpha star. I forgot actually the exact condition, but it really limits this M and C to become M A of H, which where N is 2A in this case, and H is the space of Catonius. In other words, actually, it really restricts the form of the N by N matrices to be formed on the Catonius. They become symplectic in a way, you know, something like that. Now, of course, actually, this is, why do we have to impose this condition? We don't really know, actually. You know, if you don't impose this condition, you really have to deal with this case. It's one of the cases we really could not rule out, okay? But if we take it, it gives us something physically not correct, actually. And, you know, it's anomalous and things like that. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, it's an operator that acts on the elements of the algebra in this case. Uh, yeah, maybe I alpha I is, yeah. I think I alpha I probably is I alpha in this case, yeah. Maybe I, I would involve also complex conjugation. I, I squared, sorry, is minus one, not plus one. You know, so think of it that you have a matrix like, you know, think of it that you have a matrix with 0, 1, minus 1, 0, yeah? And then each matrix like you call it A, B, C, D, yes? And 0, 1, minus 1, 0 is equal. That will give you some conditions on this, uh, but, but I think there must be some complex conjugation in this, uh, in this one, okay? So this, it acts with the complex conjugation in this case, A bar. Yeah, I forgot actually the exact uh, action, but something like that. And that limits actually the n is, remember, is like 2 alpha is, is even. And it limits the structure that it is a sub subgroup instead of, you know, for example, uh, instead of SU4, you may get SU2 cross SU2 or something like that. But in this case, it really, it, it really becomes in the space of, of Caternius. So this actually is something that, uh, and in, in a way, actually, now the space really becomes, the algebra becomes MA of H plus MN of C, where N is even. But we have to remember that we have a chirality operator gamma, where N is, yeah, N is 2A, yeah, exactly. Yes, and it's, so this is, uh, yeah, you can see A and 2A, right. Now, we have also the existence of a chirality operator gamma, and it has to act. So it may act here, or it may act here. Now, usually, we take it to act on the first, and if it acts on the first, this MA of H would split into two. Okay, anyway, what are really the first possibility? Okay, let's say even. And then you say, okay, let's start by considering the easiest possibility. What's the easiest possibility? M2 of C plus H. You agree? That happens A is 1. Now, if you really consider this model, but here, of course, actually, here I cannot operate with chirality, because if I put chirality, if I have to put it here, then it means, you know, uh, because this actually is just uh, a cationion, so you cannot act with uh, chirality on it. You have to act on this guy. If you act on this guy, then it splits M2C into C plus C, and it means, you know, your, your um, particle spectrum, anyway, is, is too little, 
and uh, a tree root correspond to the, you know, originally to the U1 cross SU2 model, the old Weinberg model, essentially. If you do physics of this, you get the old Weinberg model, okay? No, no, no quarks, just leptons. Of course, it's anomalous and everything. But this is the easiest. But of course, we rule it out because we cannot impose on it the chirality. It doesn't work. OK? So then the simplest case where you can imp uh, import the chirality condition is this A equal to 2. A equal to 2, what's this space? Is M2 of H plus M4 of C. OK? Yeah, I should finish in one minute. If we act with, you know, we have to put, remember, we have this gamma A is A gamma or something, you know, it's, uh, uh, sorry, gamma psi equal. Uh, actually, it also commutes gamma A is A gamma. We have to put this chirality in. And how do you put the chirality in? Then, if you impose chirality on this, this splits into H left plus H right. M4 of C. It's the first possibility. You know, <coughs> now, now without doing any, any el anything else actually, now I really can tell you my fermion, how many fermions I have in my space. Because the number of fermions the dimension of the Hilbert space is, in this case, is 3n squared. Yeah, it's 3 is 2n squared, but it's cut by chirality. It's, you know, half of 2n squared is 3n squared, where n is 4, you get 16. So first of all, we can predict, actually, the number of fundamental fermions in this space, which are the elements of the Hilbert space, is 16, if I stick to this finite dimensional space. In addition, they are, they follow the representation as follows, you know, let me call it A dot, A, I, okay? This is one, two, three, four, and this is one, two, which is the right, this is the right-handed, and this is left-handed, yeah? So, we are almost there, actually, <laughs> uh, as far as the particle spectrum is concerned, because, uh, Tell you what to do. This actually is new right plus e right. Actually, usually, and of course, you say it's a doublet, so it's a new right e right, new left e left, up left down left. Yeah, uh, then I have up right down right. It's everything because this is one plus color, so you are going to get um, new right e right. Oh, sorry, yeah, new left e left. Up right, down right, up left, down left. And th then actually the other symmetry was followed. But at least you have already predicted that you are really going to get 16 fermions in your algebra. And this is like the first possibility. Now, other possibilities we can, we can go on, but then they really become, they, they give, give you something extremely complicated. You know, they are talking about SU6 or SU8 gauge groups, and, and we know they don't work. So, what the claim is the following, if you classify algebras, finite dimensional spaces, the first non-trivial possibility you obtain is that of what, what would turn out to be the standard model. Remember, actually, I have not reimposed really the first order condition because when I import the first order condition, it would really give me that, this one. This would follow, you know. This is also, this comes up. Yeah, this is, you know, I already warned you. I already warned you right from the beginning that we really have no explanation for the number of families that it is three. three. Uh, but on the other hand, actually, there's nobody else in the world that has been able to give, to have a clue about why this number is three. It's not really so clear. Yeah, yeah. Not only this, actually, and from this picture, they look at leptons and quarks because of this, you know, already the, the, four, the four here. The lepton looks like a fourth color, you know. It, it, it's, it's really unified with color in this respect, you know. And if you really would insist on this symmetry, 
then you can have you know all this p minus l and uh, and you know you can get really a very nice model but really at grandification but if you are interested in the physics at present scales this is the model to to analyze and uh, you know there are many many more indications that will come along the way but i think this the fact that out of a simple classification i did not prove for you the theorem but one can you know i can go through it and uh, uh, it's it's a miracle that you know some something really arbitrary can go and tell you, look, here it is. You know, this is. Uh, Lepton is a false color of purple block. <laughs> yeah, this is the idea of Patti Salam, actually. It's called the Patti Salam unification. Oh, and it was done almost the same time as Georgia, you know? Georgia, 1974. See, Salam almost assigned me this problem, you know. He told me to choose between this and supersymmetry, but then I chose supersymmetry. <laughs> what I said. <laughs> Patti Salam. Patti is an Indian uh, physicist, you know. So. so next week I will, uh, you know, maybe I will go through the proof, and then, uh, you know, not only this, I'm going to, the way my plan is as follows, I plan to, uh, with this connections that I have the, uh, indicated, I will be able to derive the full connection of the model and uh, how the Higgs field comes out naturally. We have formulas, very specific thing. It, you know, it's, it comes uniquely. There is no. And then what to do with that after you obtain the connection? How to really get the dynamics out of the model? You know. So it's. Uh, Thank you. Okay.